Hello, I'm Ellen Thomas, uh, co-chair of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, U.S. Sections, Disarm and Wars Committee. And this spring, when we were planning monthly webinars about the 75th anniversaries of both the United Nations and of the nuclear bombs, we were so glad that Hiroshima survivor Hideko Tamuro Snyder could join us today on the anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki. She is author of an extraordinary children's story, When a Peace Tree Blooms, and a poignant 1996 memoir, One Sunny Day, which she has just revised and is awaiting an agent and publisher to bring to fruition. I would like to introduce Dr. Tamara by reading this paragraph from a One Sunny Day Initiative's newsletter. Quote, in this time, when our world seems so devoid of heroes, we have a person living amongst us who has been an ambassador of peace throughout the US and Japan for decades. She was named ambassador for the city of Hiroshima in 2014. She has spoken at the United Nations, at numerous universities, peace rallies, and community events, promoting a world free of nuclear weapons while telling her story of determination, resilience, and survival. Most recently, that's end quote, most recently, Dr. Tamara was interviewed on August 6th by Amy Goodman on Democracy Now!, and perhaps some of you have seen that. So I have some questions for Dr. Tamara, and I understand uh, you went to college in Greensboro, North Carolina, attended theological and medical school in Chicago, and spent your working life in Chicago as a clinical social worker, but you were born in Tokyo and grew up in Hiroshima. Will you tell us what life was like for you as a young child? I'm going to put some pictures up for people to see as you talk. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's so good to see you, all these faces of the people who are working on behalf of peace in the world. In 1945, August 6th, I was in a city called Hiroshima, a, a human city upon which a radiation-filled bomb was dropped and exploded. And I lost what I call myself, my own universe as I knew it. And uh, this is my parents, young parents, who married by not traditional arrangement, but by love. And I was raised there until I was four years old. And then the government called him to a military duty. And mother and I had to leave Tokyo to come to Hiroshima. And then we were having a very happy civilian life, so to speak. This is a goodbye family uh, to my father who was taken into the military. He had been an artist and was working with an auto company to support us, but uh, he had to leave. And these are members of the Tamra family. And uh, next to him, his grandfather, his father, and to the other side is his mother, and next to her and a little lost child is myself. And the rest of them are aunts and uncles, my father's siblings who came to say, and their children, goodbye to him. And this is in a very large estate that we lived in, a garden. And uh, there, there we said goodbye, and I entered first grade there, and I found one of the playmates that I became very close was my cousin Hideyuki. Grew to just love him very much, just like my brother. And uh, went on, my classmates in 1944, very happy bunch, and uh, 
in the center where there's an arrow. And again, in the center is myself having a wonderful, wonderful time. The girls who are laughing and playing and we, we did everything together. Two adults or teachers. And that was in 1944. And this is 1945 when the edict was uh, pronounced that the children between six to third in the grade school must clear out of the city. The war was becoming very thick and, and nightly raised by airplanes and most major and small cities were wiped out. And they, they were sure the time is coming for Hiroshima. The city was filled with river and there was festivals at every turn and um, we were very happy. This is a town, aerial view of the Hiroshima before the bomb. You know, you see seven rivers went through the city and, and, and we would um, uh, row a boat or we would, you know, uh, because we faced inland sea, there would be time in a receding tide, we would go and dig clams. And in a full tide, we would enjoy rowing boat. So this was my father and my mother. My father, that's a picture from post-war, but my mother's picture, this is, uh, she looks very sad because it was taken when he was uh, ordered to take soldiers and supplies to Hong Kong. And we absolutely were sure he would never come back. Now, these are the children, we, the children of Hiroshima saying goodbye to their parents and the city. And the parents felt more seriously, they probably won't see them again. A chances was very high, April 13. This was taken after the war, but uh, uh, when I went back to the Kimita village, that's where we were evacuated. and. Uh, uh, by then, the children were so much fewer, so it was empty, but I, I was very impressed to see the place where we were evacuated. And this is the temple where we stayed. And life at school and life in the temple were very, very demanding. And maybe later on when there were questions, I can go in to describe it to you. But we ran out of food, for example, and children had to go out to seek and pick edible grass. We were hungry, and the labor that we were expected to carry out were way beyond the physical ability of the children of our age, 10 and 11. All right, this is a drawing of our house. And you will see a tiny blue spot in one of them. You know, all the members of the household had their own quarters, grandpa and grandma one side and myself where arrows pointing. And we were facing a little garden and the arrow that uh, there that's uh, that's the uh, direction towards the uh, where the bomb exploded but i was my back to the the garden sitting and reading a book that my cousin had just loaned me the night before and i was going to keep up with him then there was the flash then there was the thermal wind. Would you read fr from your um, introduction to the new edition of your book, One Sunny Day, which okay. I think is an eloquent description of what happened? Okay. In 1945, on August 6th, a world's first nuclear bomb exploded over a city called Hiroshima. It was my hometown. Our house was little over a mile away from the explosion, which was destroyed, and I was pinned under the wreckage. 
I crawled out before the firestorm, not yet knowing that the end of my childhood and my entire universe had just collapsed. Our home, our vast garden of peace and tranquility, Sabre Academy, my school, all turned to ashes. No teachers or students survived. On that day of fire, while I did everything in my child's power to save myself, my mother and my only playmate, a brother-like cousin, along with relations in middle school age, all perished near the ground zero in most unimaginable ways. Mm -hmm. My mother, Kimiko Tamura, was burnt alive, pinned under a heavy concrete object, at barely 30 years of age. So was my best friend Miyoshi, who came back to the city with me the night before. My beloved cousin, Hideyuki, an eighth grader, two years older than I was, was last seen burned and radiated, walking feebly and falling on the ground, but urging his classmate to move on to save himself. The men and women burnt through all their outerwear, through the skins and exposed inners, some wandering with an eye out of the socket, and internal organs spilling out caused by the sucking force of the thermal wind force, incomprehensive to all. We were descending to hell itself. Stunned to the core, my singular focus was Tomo village assigned to our block in time of emergency. I fo followed my mother's instructions to free myself, getting to the river away from the fire. Tomo was where I believed I could find my mother. All I wanted was being held by her and here, well done, my child, and be so proud of me for the incredible tasks accomplished, listening to her voice in my heart. What happened instead was I ended up far away from Tomo in an opposite direction, eventually reunited with relations and went on agonizing search for mom and cousin Hideyuki. 75 years ago today, I was searching for my mother. These events came, comes back only in fragments without clear memory of movements. Blood-stained people crawling on grounds, calling for help, their hands extending to stunned and powerless child, desperately fleeing herself. I bordered life and death subsequent to reuniting with relatives after being in touch with my father with the help of a farmer whose family took me under their wing. Instead of finding Tomo village, I fell ill. After joining my kins, bordering life and death for a couple of weeks, followed by extreme fatigue and liver troubles, some after effects remained through my lifetime, which seldom mentioned to others. Perhaps greater than chronicity of the physical effects were subtle and not so subtle changes that also lasted a lifetime. The eeriest of all becoming joyless and detached. When the sun and the earth melted together in radiation winds and heat, the nature created genes are changed as if alienating us from a birthright. Our connection to mother earth was broken. No amount of explanations can restore us back. Dr. Tamara, how were you able to recover? <laughs> I think you skipped a picture, <laughs> one uh, where I look a little bit forlorn, but still trying to live, you know, uh, almost pretending like 
I was never there. I'm not a A bomb victim, you know, but <laughs> that didn't work. Anyway, I tried. I did everything in my power. Three years later, in 1948, my father built a house next to the factory he was helping to uh, uh, rebuild the Tamra industry. Uh, because it was very close to the, the river, you know, house was by the, the factory, was by the uh, riverbank. After the chores, especially in the evening at the sunset time, I would come and sit on this boat. I'm sure it's not floating there. 75, oh no, 1948, I came back. So, you know, over 70 years later. But anyway, I still could feel it. There was the only place in my private space I could see the past in my mind's eye. But I also were feeling so worthless, powerless, undefined, nobody. There was no one really cared about who I was. And I didn't know who I was anymore. There was no attachment that I loved any longer visible. My mother, my house, my books, my friend, my best friend, everything was gone. So I, you know, at one point, turned around from the boat, walked up to the riverbank. I had timed the trains that came, and there was one in the evening, twilight, that's my favorite hour. And I decided I'm gonna jump onto the railroad track as it came. That was sort of like in the news many times, single mothers who couldn't make it with small children jumped with the children into railroad track. And I said, well, I feel just as hopeless and joyless. I'm going to run. Except the train boom, stopped just before I could. What it was, there was a pair of sandals worn by an old man who stole my train. He jumped ahead of me and splashed all over. And I felt as if the old man was saying, you were too young. I couldn't make it, but I had my chance in life. Go home, go back and try again. So another time I sat on the carpet of clovers. And then and I, when I went like this, picking the grasses, full of, full of clover leaves, not one was three leafed. They were four leaf, five leaf, six leaf, seven leaf clovers. I didn't understand why. It was three years after the bomb and no one I saw in the literature of a bomb effects talked about this. I'm the only one, you know, because I was so lonely, so flabbergasted and devastated. I couldn't pick up and there they were. I remember, and I saved them in, in, in my um, Bible, thick Old Testament Bible that the school gave me at the end of a graduation for, I, I don't remember, student leadership or something. Anyway, this is Miss Mary F. Jones from Odessa, New York, who changed my life breathed in humanity that all the adult Japanese were so troubled themselves and couldn't even be interested, you know, how to guide or listen to anybody like a teen I was. And the back of it is Hiroshima Jogakuin Methodist School with a rooftop and that's our prayer in the bell tower and all funded by the American Southern Methodist who 
uh, built this school hundreds of years before. Anyway, Miss Jones and I became acquainted, and she was an English teacher sent from the uh, Board of Foreign Mission under J3 program, um, and she volunteered right away from New York. She really, really, she said, felt deeply about what happened in Hiroshima and wanted to help. Okay, unfortunately, my mind was closed to anybody, Japanese or anybody, but more, especially foreign language speaking person because I hated to learn anything. I had no energy or interest in learning English. And she, she was an English conversation teacher. And, I was unable to give that, but she tried and tried and tried, and finally we became friends. I opened my heart, and I think I connected to her because I still had deep in my heart capacity to love because I didn't let go of my mother, and I didn't let go of my cousin Hideyuki. And then I met another uh, emissary from the Board of Foreign Mission, this time a Presbyterian, who suggested when he made a stop on his tour around the world that I should come and study in the United States. Well, my first exposure to English was missionary who taught English through Negro spirituals. And we were so amazed in the beauty, the tune and what they were singing about. And I wanted to learn from the source of, is what they call Negro people. I said to the man who was suggesting my coming to the United States, if I can come to the United States and learn the character strength that made possible the group of people who went in spite of the bind of the society they were born into, developed themselves well enough to contribute to community because I still didn't have such a strength. I wanted to learn uh, from amongst them how they did that. And that picture you saw was when my ship after three typhoons docked in San Francisco Bay, through the fog, passing on the Golden Gate Bridge, a most fantastic euphoric experience I had since the bomb. Oh my goodness, my new life, my new learning. That's how I arrived in September of 1952. At the age of 18. Yes. <laughs> you know, Japanese school system is different from there. You start in the fall, we start in spring. So I had already had a semester of college. I was freshman in college, uh, studying and uh, majoring in um, English literature, having just covered Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. <laughs> an Oxford dictionary, this thick, mm -hmm. <laughs> under my arm. Okay. And, you, and you did a lot of studying and you spent your life helping other people. Um, I, I, I would like to ask you at this time, Dr. Tamara, if you would, you have written a book for adults, One Sunny Day, and a book for children, uh, When the Peace tree grows is that Blo blooms blooms yes it grows uh, and grows yeah. it and has you, to bloom <laughs> and you're also a poet and you shared with me a beautiful poem entitled one sunny day and i wonder if you would read that here oh okay okay this is you know about that day and what it really really took me to think in essence, okay? Title is One Sunny Day. On one sunny day, 
I lost my universe. The midsummer glaring in the bright blue sky, tall green branches quivering in the wind, whispering to a happy child, just home from a lonely country village tucked far away. Good morning, child. Welcome home. The oxygen called happiness fill the air. Shimmering lizards on the granite moving about peacefully, dancing color maps in the butterfly wings, and my kitty, Kuro, catching sun rays, glooming her coat. All was so well on that day. To be hugged and fed we stole away from the country for this moment of love and safety. Suddenly from the sky, swift moment of blinding flash, turning into a boulder of raging heat unleashed on humans and buildings, as a scorched earth shook with deafening sound in the primordial dark. Searing heat, raging and spreading. No time to pull you out, Mama. No time to find you, cousin. Rivers were flowing, voices muffled. No cooling for the burns. I watched the red sky into the night, the last night of my childhood. Hiroshima turned into ashes. My world was no more, along with my oxygen called happiness. Forever changed city, Hiroshima, watched us return, scars hidden in shame. For they stir the unthinkable, for they peeled off our dignity. On the flowing riverbanks grew four, five, six leaf clovers, picked by a lone child at sunset, searching for her lost garden and universe, visible only in her mind's eye. On one sunny day, began the search for life and conditions that must be on being a human anywhere, anytime. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Hideko. Say, there's been one question in the chat, and that is, what was the actual uh, spiritual? Can you remember which spirituals that moved you the most when you first heard the singing? Well, you know, the missionary uh, taught us just tons of uh, songs, but I think the first song she meant for us to take it to our heart was um, Jacob's Ladder. Oh. <laughs> I think she wanted us to climb the ladder back up, you know, except the female in Japan don't climb ladders, you know. <laughs> you know, the, it, 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 it's not very gracious. So, so I, I mean, a climbing ladder, okay. Well, maybe the guys could. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think now we are off of the uh, uh, live, live streaming. Um, I see a message that we were, cut, we were cut away from that after your poem. Oh, so, we were all lost 30 minutes gone. That's, That's amazing. Yes. 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 Okay. But here oh. we are uh, wanting to continue for the next half hour. And uh, I know... <laughs> 
I have a question. Yes, uh, let yeah. me just, just finish yeah. Yeah. about the song you yes. asked me. It, the, my favorite one, absolutely my favorite one that I kept on singing in my heart throughout my life is Bomb in Gilead. Mm. Yeah, you know, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the sin sick there is a mom in Gilead to heal the sins. So maybe, you know, I didn't remember it quite right, but it was just so healing. Well, someone has responded that that is her, her favorite song too, Bomb and Gilead. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could, um, uh, others must may have questions, but I know we have a, a photo of, um, of you in front of the Enola Gay. And uh, I think that was a, a very moving and maybe difficult experience for you to finally go to the museum. It's in Washington, DC, to view the airplane that dropped the bomb. And um, I'm just wondering if you could tell our, our viewers how you got there, what brought you there? <laughs> it's a very long story. I have, you know, because my cousin was very fond of B-29 structures and mechanical wonders. There was 30,000 above usually when they were going, but he could. He was two years older and he was a boy and he had no more mechanical toys. So supplies disappeared from the stores. And he, he would, at his own risk, climb to the top of the roof and watch it. And we were so frightened and calling him back down to the shelter. And he's saying, that is a remarkable plane, you know, and, 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 and it was terrifying to the rest of us anyway. And for him to be so connected and love the plane, must have looked up to the sky at ground zero, as it turned out, when it came and let go and released the bomb that wiped us all out. His face must have first melted anyway, and that he hobbled until he fell, was last seen, and then civil enough to urge his classmate to go on instead of, oh, don't leave me. It just stuck in my mind and really broke my heart every time I thought about it. And I got connected to the B-29 in all again. I got connected to wondering about the energy of the crew member that might still be there if I ever found the plane and met it and go, went inside. Could I, with my soul's energy, connect with them and say, it was a terrible time, wasn't it? And converse with it, you know. I know you had to perform your duty, and we were just innocently down there, just a child and a family. And my mom went. You know, I know what Mr. Tibbet said afterwards, uh, you know, to people who asked him about it, and I don't have any problem with it. Uh, Save the Academy was a military academy, and we understood about military orders. Anyway, and so when I was offered to come to be a part of the documentary and I was not privy to the content of the book at that time until after the documentary was finished and I was home, a week later the book was sent to me so that I found out what documentary said after could my part. You, could you say the author of the book? Chris Wallace uh, co-authored with Mitch Weiss. I was in, invited to be a part of this by Mitch Weiss, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning author of disclosing atrocities in Vietnam by the military. Mm 
So I totally understood his humanitarian approach and I accepted it. And I said, who is your co-author? I was not privy to it. He said, I can't disclose it now. And, and just a couple of weeks before documentary, and this documentary was made in February uh, and broadcast later, uh, I was contacted and just that time, they disclosed the other author was Chris Wallace, anchor of Fox News. Could you um, summarize his view of um, the justification that Truman took in dropping the bomb? Because I think that's been a subject that for me has been so interesting over the last few weeks and the other webinars that maybe other people here have uh, taken part in. You know, I was not privy to that part of the book. So, you know, Chris could probably tell you best, but I'm very familiar with the, uh, as far as a thesis, that's probably why they didn't disclose it to me because they couldn't have made a documentary with me not giving argument about that in terms of Japan did not surrender to the time that they announced it. Japan had started to, you know, send through neutral countries mm -hmm. February of 1945 because all the generals, you know, and American veterans, they should take the credit. They had defeated Japanese army. They had won the war. We had no fighting power left. And the, all the generals knew that. You know, LeMay in the, the, uh, uh, the Air Force, Leahy in the uh, Navy, MacArthur on the land. They all knew that. And even Eisenhower, way out in Europe, sent cables. You know, we would be, they all thought we, the America would be seen as really, uh, defiling the moral code of humanity. Hmm. Yeah, and I understood that. And they took the credits away from the veterans and, 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 and the generals uh, when they say that, that we had not, you know, come to no fighting power. So I think to be as fair to both sides, it was a lack in the cultural understanding and the nature of what the uh, people saw as the Japanese relationship, what culturally the Japanese emperor, imperial monarch meant yeah. to the people. You know, because the, I, I noticed that they called the, our emperor Hirohito and the evil empire, you know, it, he had no more to do with than anybody, anything. He was a symbolic head that military used to try, because we loved the emperor. The military took advantage of our love. And, and I think the, another culture, it was very difficult to understand, especially when they didn't have, they, their founding you know, fathers fought the king. <laughs> to gain independence. Mm -hmm. How can they be so very, you know, congenial to any monarchs and 2,000 plus uh, lasting uh, the family? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I think there was the, the serious breach was this lack of understanding of each other because we didn't really, I mean, we admired, you know, Euro-American advancement in industry and we followed in many ways, but I don't think that we understood how much Americans, you know, can come together and, and, and fight and be so strong with the force of the advancement of their resources to which we did not have because we were closed out of uh, being able to have metal uh, or gasoline or all these sources mm -hmm. in order for us to even continue running the country, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think cultural 
uh, uh, factor came in. And for us, it was very strange that they kept on saying, you know, all we were asking was, please don't chop off the head of our emperor. That's all there was. And in the allied forces understanding, all your, who you call revisionist historians, will show evidence that all the generals, especially MacArthur, he was going to use the power of the emperor for a, a guiding Japanese sentiment. They had no intention of killing the emperor. But, right. you know, then we could have ended the war in February when we started to send the feelers out. Well, you know, I think this, um, this the revisionist view is, is really uh, important for people to think about because uh, there wasn't a justification for dropping the bomb. To my mind, which something that isn't spoken about much is the, a sort of scientific uh, impetus. The United States had spent so much money developing these bombs and it's almost as if they had to be used. And um, <laughs> well, unfortunately, uh, uh, CR died and Truman was, was given the responsibility and he was a different person. And uh, he followed some of his advisors and that's what happened. Uh, let me just say that on the, on the chat, someone is asking, um, what was the name of the book that uh, Chris Wallace wrote? I don't think that uh, anyone said that. It's Countdown, Countdown 1945. Count, yes. Yeah. And it's a, it's a lively book in its way, but it does uh, pretty completely justify the dropping of the bombs. I think, I think, okay, you know, I'm a therapist. I'm in the healing profession. So I try to see this, everybody's side, trying to put myself in it. How could that be necessary? Culture, American culture itself, needs people who belong to it to feel good about themselves, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah, in the Smithsonian, what took me a uh, debate, uh, uh, and, and I, I said, oh my goodness, is somebody said, we can't show those pictures, you know, from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that will make us look, we did something horrible. And I thought to myself, if you pretend you didn't see it, then then you're not horrible, you know? And I didn't mean that that person was horrible, but the reasoning there seemed very juvenile, mm. you know, and not so thoughtful. Mm. However, you know, that's not my point. I think in the war weary time, and he was a fresh, you know, who wasn't really valued and consulted by with the president. He was left out in the wing, you know, but he, he, came, up, he right. came up through the ranks and he's a machine guy, just like Burns, the uh, secretary. Burns. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the state was. So he relied on Burns on everything. And I'm sure Burns would have been fit to be died if the bomb wasn't used. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, listen, I suffered and suffered to get here and I didn't know I was going to be alive at this age. So I really studied very, very, everybody's uh, writings. And I was on the panel with this revisionist historian on the uh, uh, 50th anniversary in New York City. You know, Kai Bird and, and, and uh, Alpha Ritz. Uh, next day, I, I remember having a breakfast with him. Anyway, and so heard a lot of their materials and I was very impressed. You know, and these two guys probably didn't know, you know, my position in this thing, but probably imagined that I wasn't stupid. So I would put up some argument, you know, mm -hmm. and they, they couldn't make a documentary doing that. And they didn't let me see or read the book before yeah. I participated. Yeah. 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 And, and an, another factor in someone in the chat, uh, Charlotte Dinnett brings it up, 
let's not forget uh, the U.S. obsession with the Soviet Union at that time, and the bomb was believed to send a message to the Soviet Union, like, we're, we're done with one yeah. more, and now we're going to be in charge of the world after this war by the use of the nuclear bombs. If they hadn't been used... Well, we listen, that's so nothing really new. We were always, including the Japanese, obsessed with Russian, you know, power coming down. They were always eyeing for our Northern Ireland. As a matter of fact, you know, the occupied just came in and took uh, four islands that belonged to Japanese at the end of the uh, uh, World War II. And they still own it. And they declare it's Russian territory. Since when? Since 1945. August 15. They we just can't hear you. Down. We yeah. can't hear you very well now. Oh, I'm sorry. There I we... dropped off the uh, my microphone. Yeah. And, okay. I'll, I'll say Russia was feared even since from the days of the Teddy Roosevelt. That's how Japan came up in the ranks. Teddy really thought the Japanese, you know, this samurai country just turned on uh, it, uh, the centralized government was really strong enough to be a football. Uh, and indeed, you know, uh, we were on the side of the Western power uh, with the First World War. Anyway, and, and uh, defeated Baltic uh, fleet even, you know. Uh, anyway, so in those days, even from Teddy Roosevelt since, we were very afraid of Russia, and we were very afraid of Russia, so we had a uh, colony right in Manchuria, northern end of Manchuria and, and Russia. It, and then so that we sort of like have a base for the military to defend that area, you know. Hmm. And we had a treaty with them uh, that I think lasted till the August 9th. Mm -hmm. of 1945 and then they came down you know with yeah. the tanks in the manchuria down and japan knew we couldn't fight that kind of a power yes yeah. I see yeah. ellen has a question there can you yes. go ahead ellen yes um i would like to um ask a question that came earlier uh Please tell us your recent activities about getting rid of nuclear weapons. And, be, and as part of that, uh, one of the things that I'm aware of is that you have planted trees that were that came from from trees in Hiroshima that actually came back to life. And you've done many other things as well. Would you share some of the work that you're doing with respect to getting rid of nuclear weapons? Yeah. Thank you. My approach, uh, I, I was never politically savvy. You know, I, I, I spent 40 some years being a, in a healing profession, you know, working as a therapist. Uh, I want both of us, Americans and Japanese, especially former enemies, to come collectively here. And this has to go through bringing a peace together is finding common ground together you know and finding a seed and growing it and remembering that we can go past over animosities and conflicts in a reasonable way and find common ground is the only way back, back or, or hell you know, the first elected by people president of Czechoslovakia talks the same way. The common ground is the same, the only way that we can go forth. And I wanted to have something that will be, you know, fun to watch and good to nurture. A seed, it's a life, symbol of life, being born. And then you can see it grow together. And it comes from once it was dead considered, and yet 
oh no, it wasn't dead. There's a little something coming out. And they started to collect the seeds from these trees and some very close to the ground zero. And there's called the green legacy Hiroshima in Hiroshima that collects seeds. And then we sent for it and it was seeded and here at a greenhouse in Ashland. Uh, and then it became big enough to be planted. And this happens to be a 75th year and, and lots of people already planted for the 75th commemoration. But, you know, earlier, it, it, it's not a really great planting time, but lots of folks um, planted them earlier, like last year, and, you know, the Kovalis planted last year, uh, and uh, Eugene planted last year. Uh, let, let me let me just interrupt because we just have really five minutes more. Oh uh, no, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No. I just talk, talk, talk. Okay. There are two questions. Me. Two questions that have come up on the chat. One is, um, uh, could you express your reaction to the mushroom cloud explosion that happened in Beirut on just this an anniversary, that was a few days ago, which some people are calling Lebanon's Hiroshima. And the second question is um, wondering what do you think about the survey that uh, your, your president, or is he Prime Minister Abe's, efforts to remove Article 9 from Japan's constitution. Is there a chance that that could happen? So two different questions and you have uh, five minutes. <laughs> oh dear. Well, <laughs> two both very sorry kind of <laughs> answers. Um, that was very unfortunate, what happened in Lebanon, you know. However, it was not targeted, intended, you know, it was a tragedy of negligence, okay? Can yeah. I speak up on that one, please, just for a second? That is the official story. You really need to do a lot more reading about it because there were sparks ahead of the big explosion. Oh, I, yes, yes, I, I, re I remember that. I, I remember that. I recommend that people read Pepe Escobar's piece in Asia Times, just Google it his name, Pepe Escobar, and the Beirut explosion, and you will get a, a much more interesting analysis of what that was all about. But the official story is all that it was just the ammonium nitrate, but something has to spark that to explode. It's, it's quite frightening. And I would suggest people read the comments too, because apparently veterans today, claim that they have infrared photographs of a missile that was fired. Thank wow. you very much for pointing yeah. that out because I, I would be a bit surprised that's the case. Middle East is, <laughs> you know, anywhere it could blow up and I wouldn't be surprised. And, then, and this is where you come in, your work come in, please. Your energy to discourage anything to do violent warring and human conflict solution by another piece of violence is not allowable. I mean, the worst thing is nuclear weapons, but it's the principle of the violence that comes violence that never brings peace, please. And your energy is required, all right? And let me just sit, move on to the next one because yes, I saw that too. Thank uh, you. Yeah, but anyway, uh, you asked about again, Robin. Yes. Me article Article Nine. In oh the yes, yes. You know, and I don't think you know what it I, is. <laughs> yes, I understand both sides. All right. You know, the the right wing doesn't want to, their street names and the town names to change to Russians and Koreans and then Chinese. All right. Japanese are very strictly Japanese. They like to remain Japanese. And then so then people want the umbrella of the American defense and American weapon. All right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, you can't, 
what is it, the American expression? You can't eat the, something and have it too. Uh, <laughs> that's what they are trying to do, the, the right wing people. So you're speaking about Article 9, maybe not everyone yes. knows what it is. Could you just describe it? That we cannot have warring power mm -hmm. uh, away from the country or on the, on the land. This was put in the Japanese constitution. No, no, MacArthur put it in. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, it's reasonable. I, 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 I don't want to have much to do with it either. But the progressives, which in Japan are socialists and communists, I'm sorry to say, okay? And in, in a sort of like a staid, Japanese culture of law arrangement and tea ceremony. We're not too accustomed to communist and socialist. Okay. But and that, that's just socially too bad. I'm just being authentic to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a sort of a social attitude. You know, I, 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 I'm not so sure if I can march with the red flag either. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the Russians, they really, use of uh, violence mm -hmm. is it's not, you know, I mean, Stalin killed more than anybody else killed of their own people. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, that's nothing to do with the subject. I'm sorry. I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me just respond because I thought that the peace movement, Gensik Yo and so on, those, yeah. those are motivated by the socialists and communist parties of Japan, aren't they? And they are the most, um, you know, active uh, peace peace movement in Japan. Yes, but yes, I know, I know. But the, you know, what's stuck to our skin is a social structure. We're not we're not communist and socialist in a, at large. Mm -hmm. Most people have more money than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> When I went when I went to Japan and I realized that Gensikyo was um, basically the Communist Party, and I the more I learned about it and the more I knew the people, what I ended up saying to them was, "You really should not call yourselves the Communist Party because you don't act like the Communist Party. You should call yourself the Heiwa Party, the the Peace Party, because that's what you're all about." And uh, the answer was, well, we are the only true communist party. <laughs> mm. If they can cut relationship with the international communist party, maybe the rest of the country will be a little more comfortable. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, you I... know, because the Russians took over a stole our territory. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you so much. I see that we're really out of time if we want to ab abide by our one hour of, uh, of recording. And I think, um, I mean, what I'm so moved with from you is after, after the trauma of the bomb, you have learned so much. You have become a therapist. You, you have sought to understand the deeper motivations of humans and have worked with clients and spread um, spread love and fellowship around. So I am so grateful that we have had you speaking today and I hope others feel the same way. And uh, Ellen, do you want to say a farewell comment? Yes, if anybody would like to share this uh, video with your friends and family, um, it will be put up on the Wilp US uh, Disarm Committee YouTube channel, and you can get to that at bit.ly slash Wilp US hyphen Disarm YouTube. We have several, we have all our webinars that we've, we've done in the past, this will be our fourth, they're all there. We recommend that you, you go watch them because you will learn a lot about nuclear weapons about the United Nations and we will put Hideko's uh, amazing webinar there within a day or two, right Ellen? Ellen will probably clean it up a bit. <laughs> I think it's in pretty good shape actually. Yes, yes, I think it, I think it went very well. I, I think 
I'm, 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 I'm assuming that people on the live streaming came in and heard, heard your very moving description, Hideko. So it wasn't Thank just you. us on this that would have heard that. Many other people. Thank I you. I would like to say that I have had a, the great blessing of being able to spend a, 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 quite a bit of time with Dr. Tamura this week. Um, preparing for this call and um, and I have heard so many stories and I strongly recommend that people read her book One Sunny Day um, which is her memoir and she's in the process of of finding a publisher for a revised version of it but you can find it online um, on Amazon, on Kindle, and uh, you should ask for it at your at your local library so that they'll buy it because it's a very uh, it's a it's a beautifully written book. It's very well done. Yeah, I I was I was surprised that my local library did not have it, and so I will put in a request for it. And and the the part that the, brought me almost to tears um the day it was your story about about to throw yourself in front of the train and that another an old man got there before you that that is truly amazing it, that it, um, it, and you took the been, right message yeah, from it yeah 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 so many times things happen that must be providential mm -hmm. uh, you know not because i being kept alive this long, I never, ever, ever believed it. I thought I would be gone by, you know, uh, 30s and 40s. Mm. Yeah, I didn't think I'll make 60, that's for sure. Yeah. But, so you made the best of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But <laughs> you've, been, you've been helping people your whole life. Well, thank you so much for interpreting it that way, but it just happened that way. You know, if it didn't meet my needs, which was, for example, 15 years in radiation oncology, cellular and radiation oncology at the University of Chicago, the Center for Advanced Medicine, University of Chicago Hospital, though, right? And most of the people in social work or, you know, support, they didn't last long because people kept on dying, you know, and to put everything within you to support them and try to be there at the, this crucial time. They, they just didn't wear long enough and I don't blame them, but it was perfect for me. I have an unmet needs of not, not finding my mother, my loved ones. I didn't, I, I didn't know where they were to reassure them. Look, I'm so sorry, please don't die. But beyond that, you are wonderful mother, I love you. You are wonderful boy and I love you. And all these things I could have said to them, I never got there, all right? So I had an unfinished wish I could have been there. And then to be, it was an honor for me to be there when people are confronting life and death moments and intensity what is this thing all about i'm all ears to listen to them mm -hmm. and they knew i was all there from head to toe now one I last my job one, one last question for you yes yes we are hoping that we will soon have 50 countries that have signed and ratified the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. This must be a joyous thing for you. Yes, yes, six more. Maybe in our lifetime. This, I depend on all of your energy. Please continue with what you are doing to rule out, you know, violent means, especially inhumane, this horrible, horrible weapon to be controlled and for us to put human family first. All right? We're, we no, just, we're not barbarians. We're humans. 
and let us be truly and fully human because this life comes to you only once, all right? You're not going to have it. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is it. Do everything you can with your full force and energy, please, for peace and for life. Capital L-I-F-E. Let us value it. Thank you so much. You are just wonderful people. Thank you so much, Hideko Tamura Snyder. God bless you. Hope to see you sometime again. Yes. All right. Come visit us in Palo Alto, California. Okay. You're thank welcome. you. Okay. God bless Take you care. and thank you. Okay. Keep safe and well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.